All right, thanks for joining us tonight with Encounter. And for those of you who haven't joined us before, we are a ministry of a new church in Aurora, Illinois, which is just 30 miles directly west of Chicago. The new church is Crossway Chapel, Aurora. So glad you're here. This is an outreach from that church of the ministry called Encounter, which is young singles, college students. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we have a studio audience here to my right, all the way around. We, my mom is joining us in the studio audience and the studio audience. And then there's Katie Girl from Kentucky. She's with us. There's John, who you're going to be hearing from shortly uh, about what God has done in John's life. And then there's Jackson as well, who shared with us last week. So just to give you all a few more minutes before we open the word together. My name is Tom Harkis. Just briefly to tell you about myself is I came to Christ <clears throat> Um, as a 19-year-old, approximately, and a guy got hold of my life uh, in, uh, around that age and completely changed it. I was a, a college student, like many of you, and uh, given myself to the things that the world tells me is going to make me happy, and God uh, wonderfully, mercifully uh, disrupted that and showed me the dissatisfaction. And, and since then, by God's grace, uh, when I believed and was born again, um, God uh, began this change that I've never gotten over. So as you're there um, and you're watching, please give a shout out. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to provide for you a link for afterwards because there's going to be discussion groups. For those of you who like to be a part of a discussion group with other young singles to say, hey, what does this really mean for me as a young person um, and Monday morning, 8 a.m.? How does this translate? Then really consider checking it out. You don't have to say anything. You can just listen if you'd like. They're not going to put you on this spot. So please consider um, checking out the link that will be provided for you afterwards, um, after our time together in the Word. So I'm going to pray. We're going to dive right into it. And so again, thanks for joining us. And uh, let, let me pray. And Father, we look to you and we say, um, Lord, you are great and worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And I ask in a special way that you would speak to each person that's listening. That you would open their eyes to the truth of your word in the midst of a time where there's so much uncertainty and, and unrest and, and discord and tension in, in our society and our culture. I ask in your mercy, Lord, that you would show your glory. That you who reigns victorious and how you're moving in these situations. And by your, your mercy, you might use tonight in the midst of all that's going on in each of our lives to bring us to that place of yieldedness and to a life-changing encounter with Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so let me paint the context for you because jumping into scripture without looking at the context, is it, it's, it's as if we got a letter and we look immediately at this letter when we open it, we don't know who it's from and, and uh, who it's written to, but it says, the sky is falling on me. That can mean a couple things. It can mean I'm really feeling like today is really difficult and it's a, it's a figure of speech, it's exaggeration on the sky. I feel like the sky's falling on me. Or it could be somebody who's high on drugs who feels like, you know, hey, the sky's falling on me. So much like that, but, but when we're studying the Word of God, all the more how significant it is that we would understand what God intended for us to grab hold of. Because that's where the transformation comes in a way that we could live, in a, first of all, in a relationship with the God who made us. And then secondly, in a manner that pleases Him. So important we understand the context. Timothy, who is is a young man in the faith. He has been, now been left in a city of Ephesus, which is in Asia Minor, Turkey area today. And the Apostle Paul, who was a man who had this life-transforming encounter with the risen Jesus, who he persecuted. He persecuted the followers of Jesus, and God appeared to him, Jesus, after the resurrection, after he died on the cross and rose again, ascended to heaven, Jesus actually appeared to, to Paul when he, Paul was persecuting. At that point, his name was Saul, not to be confused, but, and he was persecuting Christians. And we see this account in Acts chapter 9. And then God brought him to a place of saving faith. And so then he begins to proclaim Christ and what Christ has done in his life about the message of Christ, the good news of Christ. And part of one of those places we see is the book of, in the book of Eph um, Acts is in Ephesus. He, they're there for two and a half to three years. The, the church grows, it gets strong. Other churches are planted from it. And then now some years have transpired. And, and, and now 
There's, there's false teaching has made its way into the church and it's messing things up. And people are starting to believe that it's in ceremonialism and ritual and religiosity and they're losing sight of who Christ is in the gospel message. And it's having huge implications. People are going back into old sin and old enslavement of old habits are resurfacing. And so Paul writes to them and helps them understand, what does this authentic Christianity really look like? Because that's, that's really the theme of the book of 1 Timothy that I'm underscoring is this theme of, of that authentic Christianity. He's helping Timothy reestablish the church on biblical guidelines of what genuine, authentic Christianity is all about. So we looked at it last week, we, we launched it, and now we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17 or so, and understanding that, that now this false teaching, it's made its way into the church, focusing on the old religious law of, of ceremonialism that was never intended to make us right with God. In fact, Paul says this right before verse 12 of chapter 1, for those of you who are taking notes or for those of you who have a Bible, he says to them that the law, the Old Testament law, is written in such a way that is to not make us good, but to point out our sin, that we need a Savior. The law is good. It's intended to be good. It's a good use. But here they're misusing it, and they're getting drawn off into ceremonial religiosity to think that, hey, somehow if I keep being good enough or religious enough, it's going to make me right with God. And the reality is that that is never intended. So what Paul does then in contrast, he helps him understand that it's the gospel message of Christ's death and resurrection and that grace, that undeserved love that God has for us that makes us stand. So my mind actually goes back, and just from a, a personal note, it goes back when I first became a Christian. And when I first became a, a follower of Christ, one of the things is I began to share with those I care about and I, I love most, and so inevitably it was my family. And I remember sharing with my father, who was a man I deeply respected, is to best of my recollection for the first 18 years of my life, I talked to, back to my dad once. I mean, he didn't walk on water, but it was pretty close. I had this deep respect for my dad. And, and yet I remember him challenging my faith and, and he would probe and we would, we would watch a, a, a program that was made been something on cable TV or television about a religious program. And it was obvious that it appeared to be a hypocrite or if there was somebody that was a pastor, a religious leader that was caught in a scandal. My dad would ask me, is this your Christianity, Tom? Is this your faith? And I remember explaining to them, no, that, that's not biblical Christianity. That's not my faith. That's not the Jesus that I know and serve that the Bible communicates. But one of the things that it highlights, and I think what you can identify with, is that any kind of fake Christianity or fake religiosity is distasteful and, and, and unpleasant for everybody, for everybody. And so my dad was kind of probing just to see the inconsistencies in that. And so, not surprising, as we look at this book of 1 Timothy, we want to understand what is it that God's really called us to, that we can respond in a way that pleases him. So now, in contrast to religious ceremonialism, Paul is going to drive back this focus on the central message of the faith that should produce within us a gratitude and a joy that should mark every true child of God. This gratitude, this thanks, realizing what God saved us from, and to know the love of God for us, it brings us joy to know that he, he holds us in his hands and he has us. And so for those of us who've, been, who've done the religious thing, who I was an altar boy, I went to parochial high school. I mean, for a lot of us, we've been a part of religious circles. And we'll hear John's story in a few minutes here about his journey, is that we realize it doesn't bring satisfaction because ceremonial religiosity was never intended to bring us to God. And it can never suffice or be satisfactory for us and our own souls. And so Paul is going to now, in contrast to the dead ceremonialism, he's now going to explain, starting in verse 12, he's going to say this. He says, I thank God, or I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 12, who has strengthened me. Now, this is in contrast, is, is now Paul is referring back to his own journey. We see, again, in, in contrast to the old law, he says this, that, that cannot save that's contrary to sound teaching is when people try to make that old ceremonial law of the Old Testament something that makes us right. He says, but in, my, in contrast, he says, for mine, it was the glorious gospel in verse 11, 
of the blessed God, which I had been entrusted. And then he says, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. So Paul is saying is in contrast to the ceremonialism of religiosity is it's the central message of the gospel that made Paul right with God. And it wasn't just that he made right with God, but that God then entrusted him with a ministry to take that gospel message to the rest of the world. And so Paul goes on to say, as he continues in the text, he says this, he says, who strengthened me, because it's not something Paul had the power to do in and of himself, nor any of us have the power to be faithful to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. We need Jesus' strength to do that. He says that Christ Jesus, who Paul thanks, strengthened him because that Jesus considered Paul, speaking of himself, considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though, verse 13, you see his unworthiness. Notice what he goes on to describe of his past. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer. In other words, somebody who rails against God. I would say terrible things to God, and I would curse the, the, the people of God, the Christians. And he says, I was a railer. I was a blasphemer against one true God. But not only that, he goes on to say, but I was a persecutor. I persecuted, which means to pursue. He said, I would pursue Christians. And we see the account in the book of Acts where Paul would have believers dragged from their homes and imprisoned and beaten. In some cases, we see the example. He seems to elude the fact that he also had them killed. So this was a man who writes to Timothy, who's now been transformed by the simple message of the gospel of Jesus. He's referring back to his past when he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and then he's, he further describes himself as a violent aggressor. He says, I want you to understand, it wasn't just that I persecuted, like said bad things and, and solicited the decrees to get people arrested, but I was a, a violent aggressor. In other words, Paul personally committed violence against God's people. I think this alludes to earlier other places in Scripture where Paul was responsible for the death of believers. And so Paul says, this is what I used to be like. And when God got hold of me, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. Yet, I love this, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which which he goes on to say, this faith in love, which comes from or was in Christ Jesus our Lord, is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. I hope, please don't miss this. Paul is saying to Timothy, don't let them suck you into this religiosity of ceremonialism as if somehow that can make people right with God. But instead, Paul says, don't forget, it's the gospel that we hold to. It's the gospel that saves us. And he uses himself as an example. For, for Timothy, Paul was his hero. And so he's saying to Timothy, hey, I was the one that needed a savior. He says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor. A, I was violent against God's people, but God showed me mercy. He didn't hold me account to that, but he showed me mercy. And it says, and that grace of our Lord was more than abundant. And, you know, that should encourage us because even as we read this, as we see that, that no one's too far from God. Not even murderers who chase Christians down and have them killed. Not even blasphemers who are always railing about the one true God and cursing God and, def and defaming his name, dragging it through the mud, saying it vain, in vain, using it as a cuss word. Because notice he goes on to say, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. In other words, you can take this to the bank. You can count on it. This is it. He, he almost, you see, he, he repeats it because he says it's trustworthy. And then he further elaborates on it. It's deserving full acceptance. You think, well, isn't that what's trustworthy? Isn't, is he re being redundant, repeating himself? No. He wants his audience, and particularly Timothy, not to forget the truth of what this is. This is so important. He says it, it's deserving of full acceptance. It's trustworthy that Christ came into the world to save sinners, not to morally conform people or to call them to a standard of religiosity that they never could do or never hold to or never achieve on their own. 
I don't know if you're like me, but that, that provides great encouragement to me. When I think back as a very religious young man, and I'm going to church for a few, several months or years of my life, every morning before school, thinking that if I could just, you know, go to church, things would be better in our lives and, and better in our homes. And, and I just remember thinking, like, if, if I just don't do this and I, and I stay away from these things and do these other things, that, that God's going to show up and I can please God. And I realized time after time that I failed. I remember in high school and as a young college student just saying, well, I'm not going to get drunk and I would drink too much. Or I'm not going to get angry and I wind up getting in a fight. And the reality is, is, that, is that the scriptures help us understand that, that there is no one who is righteous. No, not one. No one can deserve God. No one is deserving. The Bible goes on to say in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, that no one seeks God. No one does good. No, not one. And that includes you. It certainly included me as well. And it's the same thing as Paul is saying about himself as he says, Christ came in the world not to save righteous people who think they're righteous, but no, it's to save sinners, those who grab hold of it, this understanding that they need a Savior. And he doesn't stop there, but verse 16, he goes on to say, yet, he says, for this reason I found mercy so that in, in me, that's implied, in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And so what Paul is saying is, as you look at the text in verse 16, as he writes to, to Timothy, he's saying, focus on the gospel. It's, it's Christ's death on the cross that makes us right with him. That's the focus. That's, it's not in the religiosity and ceremonialism and going to church this many times or genuflecting or, or getting dunked this many times or eating these certain ways or doing these foods or beating your body, or these aesthetic things. No, Paul is saying it's the central message of the gospel, which literally means the good news. And the reason is because we who are sinners, we who rebelled against God, we who have shaken our fist at God, are those who in his mercy can come to know and love him. And I used to think, well, that's, you know, sinners, those are other people. But then as I began to look at God's word, what God used a verse in the scriptures, and it's in the book of Isaiah, it's in the Old Testament, about the center of your Bible. And he says in chapter 64, verse six, he says that your righteous deeds are filthy rags. That, that, that even in your best day, your best behavior your, your best Easter clothes, if you ever go to church on Easter, your best day. He said, they're filthy before me because God is so holy. And we see this in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says in the Sermon of the Mount, if you've ever hated somebody, you've committed murder in your heart. Before God, you're guilty of murder. And he says, if you've ever lusted after another individual, you're committed adultery. And when I understood that in Scripture, thinking that I was basically a good person, keeping a, somewhat of a religious lifestyle, and I was okay with God, God and I were okay. Then I realized from Scripture and the biblical truth is that I was far from God because I, in my heart I had committed adultery hundreds of times. Or pornography was a big part of my life, and I just remember hundreds of times, and I was guilty as an adulterer, and then not only that, but as a murderer. I was a fighter. I learned to box. I boxed in college because I was a fighter younger Age, when I younger age and I had some anger issues and I would unload on my fists. And so before God, and when I properly understood my condition, it wasn't I was a, a, a righteous religious man better than most, but instead I was a murderer, an adulterer that needed a savior. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying that's the truth. It's not in ceremonialism. It's not in this keeping of this Old Testament law, but it's in the gospel. It's in Christ Jesus and it's in him alone. And then as Paul says in his life, he was a perfect example. He was an example to anyone who believed. Because if, if God can save Paul and make Paul right with God, then he can save anybody. If he can make a blasphemer, persecutor, a violent aggressor right with God, then he can save anybody. And so what are two takeaways? Let me give you two quick takeaways. The first one is this. Is gratitude and joy accompany true faith? Gratitude and joy accompany true faith. There's this inseparable link between gratitude and joy when you genuinely know Jesus Christ. And the reason we see this in the text, he starts off with, I thank God. He says, notice, remember, verse 12. I thank God. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me. And he goes on to talk about the gospel. There's this gratitude. And as you're reading this, you see this, this sense of joy welling up 
in the text because Paul understood as a previous a blasphemer, a persecutor, a, a violent aggressor against the faith in God's people that God saved him. And, and there was this love that wells up within his heart, this joy. And so again, I would submit to you the first takeaway is that gratitude and joy accompany true saving faith. It does, it not people with the greatest frown, I'm religious and I'm a killjoy and are you having fun, knock it off. But instead is that we can know freedom to, to be set free from the old ways of life, to be set free to walk in newness of life, that gratitude and joy accompany true saving faith. And then secondly, second takeaway is that true salvation puts God on display. Because notice what Paul goes on to say is that his life, his salvation, is it's demonstrated God's patience. And so not surprising, notice verse 17, you see this, this almost this euphoric praise that goes out to God. Verse 17, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory now and forever. Amen. You see that this praise, because when we understand the gospel, when people come to true saving faith, it puts God on display because of his mercy and his loving kindness. So I've been doing a lot of talking. Now I'm going to ask you to do some thinking with me. First of all, is, is what are the liveaways? What are you going to take from this message? Scripture says that those were to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who hear the truth and have their ears tickled from it. Like, oh, that was kind of cool to hear. But instead, that we take the truth and we live it out. And so what are some liveaways? What, what are you going to take from the message that intersects with your life? And so let me first speak to you believers. Is there a joy in your life? Is there a wells up or, or and a gratitude that, that consistently anchors your lifestyle and your, and your disposition, your personality? You know, I've seen it time and time again is, is people that were, were Mr. Grumpy or Mrs. Grumpy and they get saved and they become Mr. and Mrs. Glad, joyful. And, and I, at times in my life, um, I, it's important for me, much like Paul, to remember where God saved me from. Remember where I was. Remember where I would be had he not in his mercy. And you know what begins to happen when I begin to meditate on that? Gratitude and joy. Because I remember back. And so let's not be forgetful people. If you know Jesus Christ, review that in your mind. And then for those of you who have yet to bend their knee to you, please listen up. I'm talking to you just here for a moment. For those of you who have yet to bend your knee to Jesus Christ, I just want to encourage you, don't stay with ceremonialism. Don't stay with religiosity or moralism to think, well, I determine my own morality. I'm going to invite a friend of mine to come on up here, and he's going to share. His name's John. John, come on over here. John's going to share is what God has done in his life. Um, so, so John, tell, tell us a little bit of, um, of what has God, maybe we can step back just a little bit there. John, tell us um, what has God done in your life? You grew up and you're grateful for your background as a home, but tell us a little bit of your journey. Yeah, so for the first, I want to say 20 years of my life, I grew up in the church, uh, played instruments, you know, a lot of movement, really religious. And, you know, you just hear it all your life. Yeah, Jesus Christ died for my sins. And you just kind of think, okay, yeah, whatever, blah, blah, blah. When's the church service over, you know? Um, and then I, don't know, I got to college and just um, a lady that just challenged me. I only met her one time. It's crazy, but she challenged me and um, she's asking me questions about my life, about my Christianity. And, and it was at that time that God, the Lord just revealed that, um, that I don't know him. And, that, um, and I realized just how much of a sinner I am that, you know, if I hate somebody, I'm, I'm a murderer in God's eyes if I look at a woman with lustfully then you know um that's adultery and just and i realized you know i'm not righteous i'm not good and that there's nothing that i deserve you know and john as you're sharing you know I, I i kept thinking to myself um as you're sharing how many young people like yourself who are fortunate enough to grow up in a church have christian parents that are maybe even praying for them and yet they they, they lose sight of the main focus of a need to be transformed with a life-changing encounter with Jesus, and yet get caught up in religiosity and ceremonialism, much like you've described to me, and as I've heard and as you've just shared, that you, you, you were religious, you were going to church, you played in the worship team, and you played, in, in, and yet uh, it was kind of dry and dead. It was ceremonialism, it didn't satisfy. In your experience, how, of young people you know, that, that are churchgoers, how many people, what percentage do you think of most of the people that you've interacted with over the years are in that similar boat? would you say, from your own estimation? 
in my own estimation, I would say um, around 85 to 90% of people in church, whether it be my age or even some adults, they'll just come in there, dress really nice, go on the, their phone the, the whole sermon, and or they'll just sit there. They can't wait till the, ser the service is over so they can go get coffee or something. It's just, um, mm -hmm. and they don't, you know, they don't, the, the gospel's not deep in their heart. It's taking such for granted, oh, the gospel, the gospel, you know. If, if Jesus Christ didn't um, die for sinners, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't diminish God's glory. You know, if everyone went to hell, God would still be glorified. And just, and we don't realize just how glorious uh, Christ is. He's a mighty God. So th there are many in the church that uh, that possibly will perish. And there are many that, uh, that are there, but there's no, there's no love for Christ deep inside. Well, let me ask you this, John. You know, as you as you did come to faith in Christ, and God got holy that night, and you guys were out, out kind of at a weekend excursion, a group of, group of you guys in, in a Bible study, and, and God used it in your dialogue with that woman and to really help you really see where you were. How has God changed your life? What what, what way has your life been different now? Um, so for me, um, I'm satisfied. Let me, I can say that for sure. I'm sat, I'm fulfilled. You know, I don't have to look to football or this or that. To bring me joy I just I finally realized that you know no, no matter what I accomplish no matter what accolade or what title I earn it's it's just so empty and like I finally I finally see I always felt I didn't know how to put it into words and I just have so much kind of like you said before joy and gratitude and you just kind of like Paul the Apostle said he said you know I was a former I was a former blasphemer a murderer and then um, God just you know he showed me his grace and uh, you realize that every day is a gift from God and that uh, says in Isaiah forty seven, we're created for His glory, and that that that's and that brings me the most joy. And it's Christians are real Christians are joyful people. You know they're satisfied because they have Christ, and and I can see that in my own life. And John, you you live with me along with a couple other guys, and I see you laughing a lot. Right. And is it? Do you think because your sense of humor is so great, or the other guy's sense of humor is so great? I say both. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, John. So. And, and I will say, these, these guys do a lot of laughing. But with that, um, for those of you who don't know Christ, is I want to encourage you, as, as John shared in his journey, is don't l leave yourself thinking that, well, hey, I, I got a, a taste of Christianity and I'm okay. I mean, I, I was raised in the church, but realize that that can never take the place of being born again. It's just like me going and stepping into a garage doesn't make me a car. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. A true Christian. So the call to you is believe in the Lord Jesus. You know, I want to say, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning about my dad and how he would probe me and for years, I, I remember praying for him every day. It was all, it was it almost became a re religious ceremony. I'd say, Lord, just please save my dad. And I'd go through these prayers. And I remember um, three months before he died, and my dad was out in California and completely out of context. Um, as my dad, and I was working in business then out in Los Angeles, and my dad said to me, um, Tom, I want what you have in Jesus, but I don't know how to get it. You have to understand, for, for, as, for a young man who'd been praying for his father for six years, every day, pretty much, at least the best of my recollection, and for to have his heart so open and tender was just a testimony of God's loving kindness and mercy. That my God, my my by God's grace, I'm gonna get a bear hug in heaven because my dad died a few months after that, uh, suddenly from a heart attack, and I just can't help but anticipate that I'm gonna be able to get a big hug from my dad, same forehead, same head. I'm sure we'll recognize. And actually, you know, I I don't know if we'll be any, well. Side side note, I, I don't know if there'll be any bald people in heaven because, or maybe there everybody will be bald because isn't there a song that says there'll be no parting there? Know, parting so anyway I'll, I'll keep my day job but anyway just to say is the reality of, of knowing Christ is that I can't help but think that my dad and I were gonna are gonna greet each other again and be able to spend a good portion of eternity hanging out together and I hope you'll be there as well so don't don't let religiosity ceremonialism that de never delivers keep you from a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ if you have any questions please don't hesitate to Contact us. You can go to the website if you want to make that more confidential and personal, crosswaychapelaurora.com. And you can message myself or one of the other leaders, say, please follow up with me. We'll be glad to get in touch with you.
and answer any questions you have. Pray for you. If there's anything we can do, please let us know. We'd love to be able to serve you. Thanks for joining us.